I can't stand behind the lectern because it's too tall. I'm only six foot, and that thing's for about six foot six. <laughs> well, good afternoon. It's pretty wonderful to be in a room full of great teachers, I'll tell you that. I'd go a long way to be here, thank you. I did come a lot. I was in Newfoundland. So, everybody's learning to be better. That's our profession. It's also the medical profession. It's also child care profession. It's everybody who cares for others. We struggle always to be better. It's called parenting. When you're a grandparent like I am, you think, oh my God, the mistakes I made. Is he going to make them with this kid? <laughs> Yesterday was my granddaughter's second birthday. And uh, two years. She knows all her letters. What's this? Mmm. What's this? Uh, what's this? Key. What's this? Itch. What's this? O. Oh. How'd she learn all those letters? From the Toys R Us game she has. <laughs> they seem to have no house, just all these plastic games that light up. And <laughs> That's their living room. But the joy of her life is that every day my kid reads to her two or three books, so she gets all of the above all of the time. Then there are those kids that don't. So for me, my mandate's very clear. I want to promote critical and creative understanding for every child with as many different text forms as I can find. So my whole talk today is about the past and the future, and then you have these amazing teachers and principals talking to you about today. I want to talk about what was, what could be, then you take what is and see how it fits. We don't want to throw everything out. We keep the good stuff, get rid of the bad stuff, and aim toward the light. That's our goal. So the two words here that matter to me most are critical and creative. And critical literacy means we look at text carefully. It doesn't mean negatively. You can read a great review of a film. You can read a positive review of a song. It doesn't mean negative. So get rid of that critical means negative. And creative means you enter into it. That's all it means. I have a say in what I'm making sense of. Those two things are the whole essence of being a literate human being. I have some say in this. So as I go through my little slides, so you can stare at those and not me, I want to start with three little pigs. Is it on? That's your job, Larry. Tell me if it's on. Okay. I tried to pick a story you'd be familiar with. <laughs> and uh, I was working with the kindergarten class. As two people have heard this story before, but I'm doing it again, and I do it really well, so just listen again. <laughs> That's you, Kathy. So I was holding it up with the kindergarten. And aren't kindergartens cute? Who works the kindergarten kids? Three of you. <laughs> <laughs> the others are smart. <laughs> we know kindergarten kids are cute for about 20 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm holding the book up, ready to roll. And this kid puts his hand up. Don't you hate that? Like, you've got a lesson here, you're going to read to them, you're going to read aloud, think aloud, do the good stuff, and a kid puts up his hand. Now, you guys are clever at not noticing. <laughs> Very clever. But I said, what is it, kid? I've got a lesson to do. And he says, I know which one builds the brick house. I said, you couldn't know that, I haven't read the story yet. Sit down. I teach tough. I said, well, which one do you think builds a brick house? And the kid says, the one in the suit. I said, why do you think that? Because the guys in suits are the smart ones. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> but just ask Moore's the suit people. But the point is, at five without print, he has a brain that can work faster than mine. He had picked a stereotype out, and I'd never, I read the book a hundred times, I'd never seen the stereotype. Because they watch images, that's how they decide. Dad comes home from work, is this the time to be funny or serious? Or disappear? <laughs> they're reading signals all, they're watching your faces all the time. Mm, she's going to read a story. Looks like a good one, because she's smiling. <laughs> they know who we are, so I really, and I asked the class, class, which one would you pick to build the brick house? And they all said the guy in blue jeans. Because they watch Homes on Homes now. <laughs> The guy in the surfer pants, nobody hires him. <laughs> and he becomes a teacher. Okay. 
Do you have surfer pants? Okay. Do you? Do you? Do you? I knew you did. Okay. <laughs> So I love the fact that we're talking about thinking here and feeling and words are important to that because then we can abstractly think about thinking and feeling, but we got lots of ways to do that without words, so relax. This is the quote I took my quote from just to show you that I've read something. <laughs> oh look everyone, my history before my eyes. And no one in here knows those images, do you? you oh yeah, they're fridge magnets, that's why you know them. <laughs> That was my life. It came about in 1948, uh, they redid the images because when soldiers came home from the war in North America, they needed, they'd have a lot of babies. So Dr. Gray was in charge and he created the, the, uh, the visuals to go with the words that were there before because he wanted a, an American family, and we called it the Canadian family, that would represent what the best is. Well, boy, did he goof. So I had a student teacher in Nipissing at North Bay last week say, I said, what was that? She says, the ideal family. They're weird. They're not ideal. <laughs> you want to live next door to those people? I'd be afraid. <laughs> but when I was a kid at the breakfast table in grade one, I said to my mom, how come the dad in this story wears a fedora and a suit at the breakfast table? And she said, that's a book, this is life. <laughs> And what's wonderful about today is our books, our texts, include the children's lives. And that's the biggest change that we have, and that's the change for the future. You're going to find more and more that text will represent every child. Not every time, but, uh, but at least once. So I will find myself in a book in your class at least once, every month, I hope, and every year ten times. And that's when it's exciting that I don't have to fit into the spectrum of children who have these ideal lives. My life might not be ideal, but I got a book about me. As student at Teachers College where we work, one of the first things they create is a book about me. They're 24 years old, they've been in school for five years, and they hold that book so precious. Who in here made that book when you were at Teachers College? Anybody? They're all hired in Brantford. Okay. <laughs> Oh, look, everybody, I'm doing my whole life. <laughs> this is fifth grade. Can you see it okay? The Treasury Reader. We got to fifth grade. Our principal came in to visit us, and our teacher, he brought in the new books. This was the new books. Every boy in that class thrilled to get that navy blue reader. Big fat one. All full of British stories by British authors, by men. Adventure stories. Here was the first page in the book. <laughs> and I remember thinking, thank God it's illustrated. <laughs> I love doing this with parents. I did this with parents the last three weeks. One of you was there, but because um, when parents think schools haven't changed since they were there, I show this and they gasp. I mean, schools used to be like that. Oh, far worse. And this is, of course, not Jackie O, <laughs> which, of course, uh, the Americans keep saying to me, this is Queen Elizabeth's mother, so that means she's quite old. And this was, our, this was every boy's dream then in grade five. <laughs> so when she died, all the men my age were so sad because she was our first erotic literature. We pinned her on our wall <laughs> behind the door. Thank you, madam. <laughs>